is growing at a fast pace. But to, but to solve the problems for the next billion, what we need is innovation and not tradition. And scaling an innovation and making it a force for good is much like training a dragon. Our effort in this session today is to show you how you can train your dragon. So let me tell you the story here. The first step in your journey to train your dragon is realizing that you have this audacious ambition of controlling a dragon. It comes with its own set of hurdles. You need to know what it takes to break down a large ambition like that into small achievable goals. But here's a catch. Training a dragon is not an everyday affair. So how do you do this? In your effort to train it, you can take lessons from many different sources and seemingly unconnected things. And as you start to train your dragon, you will find that it takes a contrarian blend of creativity and discipline. You will need to give dragon enough slack to find its natural instincts to soar, to glide, and to do battle. And at the same time, you have to exercise discipline and control so that one day it can become the force for good. And there will be dark moments during this journey, and you will have to persist with it. And this is where persistence comes in. And finally, will, there will come a day when you will become one with your dragon. And it becomes less about you, and it becomes more about the need for people to accept it. Ladies and gentlemen, all these traits that I spoke about are not so different from what it takes to be a successful innovator. I'm very excited to present a session that has been curated as a master class in interdisciplinary learning. And to get us started today, I'm going to invite Mr. Harsh Mariwala, chairman of Marico, to give us a war cry. So can you please put your hands together for Mr. Harsh Mariwala? So first of all, let me say that I'm very, very passionate about this subject of innovation because it has played a very, very important role in my life in terms of my business. And post that, when I realized that innovation is very, very crucial, not only to businesses, but to social organization, uh, to NGOs, and to the whole country, uh, we decided to set up a Marico Innovation Foundation. The objective of that foundation is to fuel innovation. So what I'm going to do in the next 20 minutes is talk about my experiences in innovation, what we have done and how it has helped us. And then I'll talk a little bit about the Innovation Foundation. We are helping some uh, social organizations scaling up and what have we done, what new approach have we done in the area of innovation which has helped them or likely to help them. So to me, innovation is anything which is uh, adding value. It could be a process, it could be a product. So anything which creates value to me is innovation which is unique. Um, I'll go back into the time I started working many, many years back when I was a very young lad. And my family was in business of uh, edible oil in bulk. We were selling oils in bulk. Um, and one of the product was parachute coconut oil, which was sold in big tins. And when I joined the organization, I realized that if this business was converted from small to la uh, from large tins to small tins, it'll really help us uh, scale up and make it more profitable and sustainable. So with that, we started expanding distribution network. But the real break came in when we started making innovations. Um, we realized at that time, I don't know how many of you use coconut oil, but um, um, coconut oil at that time was packed in tins. The whole market was in tins. And we realized that if we actually converted that market from tin to plastics, it'll make a big difference to the consumer. Plastics is convenient to pour. It's better to look at. And most importantly, it's, it's cheaper than tins. So we thought that we had a winner. We could just convert that whole market from tin to plastics. But when we actually went to the trade and asked, started asking dealers, they said, no, nothing doing. This will not sell. Because prior to us, a few years back, somebody else had come in plastics. And the whole, the way they had packed their uh, product, uh, a lot of oil losing out, a square-shaped bottle. And when the dealer used to stop um, the day and lock his shop and open next morning, he realized that the rats had bitten the oil, and the whole shop was getting spoiled. So we had a big, big um, resistance to this, and the re retailers were just not willing to stock in plastic. So we went back to the drawing board, and we said that, can we design a bottle, which is a round-shaped bottle, which is difficult for the rat to get hold of, and we will pack it in such a way that the no oil will lose out. 
and we actually developed that bottle and kept it in rat cages. And a few days, no rat biting. With those pictures, we went to the trade, and we said that now, you know, we have proven that rats cannot bite our coconut oil. Please store it. So I think that played a very important role in converting the whole market from tin to plastics. And every month we would go on, go on tracking whether what is the conversion from tin to plastics. And today the whole market is in plastic. And but for the innovation, we would have been struggling at a very low market share. Very simple innovation um, in a kind of a commodity kind of product, but very effective. It has paid, played a huge dividend for us because the whole market is turned plastic and it has really helped us become the clear market leader in this category. Now come winter, coconut oil freezes. So again, we had a big challenge. People were going back to tins. So we had to design a wide mouth container with a spout. So that also worked and the conversion from tin to, pl pl tin to plastic continued through the winter also. We also, have, we also saw that in a sachet pack, which is one time usage pack, we had a very low market share. And we said, can we do something innovative? And what we did was actually we came back with a, with a one rupee mini bottle. I don't know how many of you have seen it. And it, we did really captured the market and our, in that segment also our market share jumped up. So what I'm trying to say is that innovation is possible in each and every aspect of business. It need not be high tech innovation. It could be a simple innovation. But innovation has to be pursued. You have to go on at it in terms of execution. Innovation is just not creativity, it is ideation, it is a lot of dialogues within the organization, and most importantly, how do you bring it in the rigor? Innovation is very, very crucial. In 1996, we went public, and at that time, um, 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 Hindustan Lever had acquired Tata Oil Mills, and one of the brands which came through their way was uh, Nihar, and they went public saying that we will wipe out Marico, we will wipe out parachute because we are much stronger. And prior to that, they had given a big tough fight to Colgate and really impacted Colgate in the oral care segment. So there was a lot of fear within our system. And they were trying to create fear so that we would, I would sell out the company to them. And there were a lot of approaches made to me saying that please sell out, otherwise you'll be history. But I was very clear that we will not sell this out. So how did we take them on? Because our, uh, in the meantime, what happened was there was a lot of fear in the marketplace. Our share prices fell because they thought that we will not be able to survive the levers onslaught. So there was a big, big challenge for us in terms of how do we take them on. And um, we said that can we improve the product? Yes, we did something on the product front. We improved the clarity of the product. But the bigger challenge was how do you get the consumer to, to be hooked with you? So for that, we, we, um, we, did, uh, we advertised a campaign which was leveraging on purity of coconut oil and also the how coconut is used in Indian uh, religion in terms of as a as a good omen too when you enter a house or when you get married and I think that campaign really really worked very very well and the biggest challenge for us was distribution and how do we motivate our field force because there was a big fear not only our in our own field force but our distributors field force so we actually called them to a to a conference where we decorated the whole hall in a war room scenario where they had to enter through a tunnel and we showed a film to them. And I think that uh, I would like to show that film. So can we play that? Parachute, parachute. सम तेरी राहों में जा तक लुटा जाएंगे पैराशूट पैराशूट हमको तेरी कसम तेरी राहों में जा तक लुटा जाएंगे कूद क्या चीज है तेरे कदमों में हम सर निहार का कलम कर चढ़ा जाएंगे पैराशूट पैराशूट नजर को झुका के ही दम लेंगे हम तेरी धरती पे हो जो कदम गैर का उस कदम का निशान तक मिटा देंगे हम उस कदम का निशान तक मिटा देंगे हम 
जो भी दीवार आएगी अब सामने ठोकरों से उसे हम गिरा जाएंगे पैराशू पैराशू तुमको तेरी कसम तेरी राहों में जा तक लुटा जाएंगे फूल क्या चीज है तेरे कदमों में हम सर निहार का कलम कर चढ़ा जाएंगे पैराशूट पैराशूट So this film really had a big, big impact on our field force. We were able to motivate them. We gave them a lot of ammunition in terms of uh, direct calling. How do you meet the competition in different places, uh, schemes, and things like that? Uh, Levers tried not once but three, four times. They launched it, relaunched it. They got some market share. They got a, about ten or twelve percent market share, but not at our cost. Some other weaker players uh, lost some share, and over a period of time, Levers realized that they could not impact us. and they started losing interest in this category and lo and behold after some time after a few years we acquired that brand from them so for an indian player from being selling out to an acquiring a brand from an a large mnc like levers i think that was very important so what i'm trying to say is you need to create innovation at all levels you just cannot say that i need to do innovation only in product i think product processes distribution even things like how do you mitigate competition and arrive at some advertising which is innovative which is impactful is very very important important to create innovation i think over a period of time uh, we have done many innovations but we don't have too much time today so i'm not going to talk about it uh, innovation whether it's a fola whether it is revive starch or whether it's kaya skin clinics we have used innovation in a, in in very aggressive manner within the organization but i think for innovation to thrive you need the right culture so i would say that innovation just doesn't happen within the organization you need to create the right culture a culture of openness a culture of meritocracy a culture of boundarylessness where people are not afraid to take risk because if somebody is afraid to take risk within the organization innovation will not thrive so it's okay to fail but it's important to take risk i think we need to have cross functional forums experiment more and validate less and i think the role of top management in this is very important they have to send the right signals they have to encourage innovation what we do at marico is to actually have innovation conclaves where we we actually award innovations uh, within the organization every year and the innovation winners go and talk to all the organization members in terms of what has been the innovative approach which has made them win win this award and on average we get about 40 entries internally within the organization which have been innovative i think every time when a brand is making a plan i would ask them what is the innovative thing you're doing so if you go on perpetually reinforcing within innovation within the organization innovation thrives and then that's how you create the culture of innovation So let me sum up uh, the Marico experience by saying that innovation flourishes when there is a gap between aspirations and resources. Innovation is beyond creativity. It needs collaboration, it needs rigor, persistence and resilience. And innovation and people have played the most important role in Marico's journey. So innovation is very very crucial and I would urge each organization as leaders uh, to to create that culture of innovation and support innovation, go on reinforcing innovation at different from different angles. Let me now shift focus from Marico to Marico Innovation Foundation, where the objective is to fuel innovation within social organization, within business organization, and one of the initiative within that is uh, what we call social impact acceleration programs. So we've been working with uh, social organizations and trying to help them innovate to scale up. I will take three examples. The first one is under the mango tree. The team is here. Uh, under the mango tree is a business that focuses on bee pollination. the role of bees and bee pollination is increasing bee productivity it's a very significant contribution to the agriculture production of a broad range of crops in particular fruits vegetables fiber crops and nuts and utilization of pollinators especially honey bees is considered as one of the cheapest eco friendly approaches available to maximize the yield of cross pollinated crops the payback if you invest in bee pollinators is depending on the crop is one to two years and when they came to us I mean, the whole objective was to look at how do I impact tribal farmers. The byproduct of the bee pollination is is honey, and then how do I market honey? Um, so they were getting all the funds from donors, and they were able to impact in a small region tribal farming and 
very small production of honey which was marketed. And when we saw the financial, we realized that actually if we can change their focus from only looking at tribal areas to larger agriculture areas where there is a big need to improve agriculture productivity, where the payback is in the range of one to two years, then it can be actually bit converted into business and whatever surpluses which are generated from that business can be invested in giving back something to the society through the tribal areas. We see this as a very big business opportunity. Uh, we will, Marico will support them in our agri extension activities. We will put them on touch with many other companies which are in agri extension. And hopefully with all that, their scale will increase. And because of the scale, they'll be able to, able to support more tribal areas. So the change basically in mindset in terms of from looking at only a tribal area from the beginning to actually looking at a business opportunity and, and giving the surplus arising out of the business opportunity to tribal areas is the big change we've been able to uh, brought up, bring about. This is still in prototype stage. We are still working on it. So it's still too early to come to a conclusion. But I think I'm quite excited by this, by this project. The second project I want to talk about is Akshay Patra. I'm sure all of you heard of Akshay Patra. They came to us and they have very large centralized kitchen with very high capital expenditures. And they have one or two kitchens per city and mainly delivering midday meals to government schools in the city. And in a city like Bangalore, vans have to travel something like 70 kilometers to, to the traffic to reach the schools. So what would happen is because of that, the cooking needed to start at 4 o'clock in the morning, the meals had to be ready and loaded onto vans by 7 a.m. to be dispatched to the, to the schools. Because of early start, they were not able to employ women, so only male employees. Longer delivery periods, the food was getting stale, and the food was also getting cold. So we went back to them and we said that, can you actually work on a different model, which is shift from centralized kitchens to hub and spoke kitchens. So there will be a central hub to look after procurement, storage, cutting and chopping. And the menus and the recipes could be designed centrally, but the spokes will receive the ready-to-cook packs from central hubs and they will cook it there. So if they change from this centralized to hub and spoke model, what will be the impact? The, they were able to deliver within a period, period of one hour, so hot meals to the kids. The, school, the spoke were starting their cooking at 7 a.m., so employment to women. Reduction in capital cost because smaller space needed to have the spoke model and hotter meals to the kids. And in addition, the kitchens could sweat more, they could supply meals to serve uh, to other community kitchens, to canteens. Um, and they're also thinking of starting breakfast services to schools. So again, a change in approach from a centralized kitchen to this uh, is something which we have suggested to them and they are going to prototype that very soon. <clears throat> one more last example. Uh, we are working with uh, one livelihood uh, uh, organization named Yuva Parivartan in Maharashtra. They were providing livelihood by having fixed centers in urban areas. And mobilization of rural youth in urban center was a big challenge due to youth mindset, parents' mindset of not letting their son to go to a city for training and employment. And the annual impact in terms of through that approach was only 18,000 kids to be, to be trained. And post our intervention, we suggested to them that why don't you look at rural mobile cap, camps instead of fixed urban camps. So now they have devised a seven to day, 10 day workshop, which are held in very rural deep catchments in local temples or in community rooms or someone's large home. And the kind of courses they offer in the catchment is dependent on the local needs. For example, if it is a coastal village, they will, where fishing is a major occupation, they will give training in the area of fishing, making nets, equipment, things like that. So this whole approach again has been low cost. And because of that, they have actually been able to scale up from 18,000 uh, to 130,000 youth in three years. So again, a change in mindset, the way you work, has made a big, big impact to your Parivartan. So I would uh, say that these are the kind of things we have done in Marico as well as Marico Innovation Foundation. And um, let me end by saying that apply conventional thinking and you will come up with conventional solutions, but open your mind and you will find a world of opportunities opening up before you. Uncommon sense, that's how we call it. Thank you.